So, as we all know by now, there is a new Disney movie out. And it is, in my humble opinion, the best Disney movie ever made. It is actually my favorite movie. At all, ever, period, and full stop. It has dethroned the Lord of the Rings trilogy. <laughs> that is not something I thought any movie would ever do. But I gotta hand it to him. Encanto did it. On the off chance that you are one of the ten people who has not seen Encanto yet, it follows the story of Mirabel Madrigal. She is the youngest girl and second youngest grandchild in the Madrigal family, a family in which everyone has a unique magical gift. Everyone except Mirabel. And her abuela, but that's not the point. The family's gifts started in Mirabel's parents' generation. Abuela not having one is not remarkable. <laughs> Their miracle was granted to them when Alma, that's Abuela's name, and her husband Pedro had to flee their home shortly after the birth of their triplets. During this flight, Pedro sacrificed himself for his family, and either Alma's grief or Pedro's sacrifice or a blending of the two ignited this candle and set the miracle alight, raising the mountains around the refugees and growing a magical living house for Alma and her children to live in. Ever since then, in the Madrigal family, every kid is given their gift when they are five. I'm presuming on or around their fifth birthday, but don't quote me on that. They do this by touching the door handle on a magic door which then grants them their gift a ceremony that happens in front of the entire town. <laughs> Except when Mirabel touched hers, the door simply vanished. It's now been ten years since then, Mirabel is fifteen, and in the years between then and now, her tia Peppa and tio Felix have had another child, Antonio, whose gift ceremony serves as our inciting incident. Antonio is understandably nervous, <laughs> feeling the pressure of being the first gift ceremony since Mirabel's failed one. What if it doesn't work? But she comforts him, and during his ceremony, when he can't summon the courage to walk up the steps to his door on his own, she steps up to help him when he asks, and it's a really sweet scene. Antonio really is the cutest kid ever. <laughs> The ceremony goes off without a hitch. Antonio receives the gift of speaking to animals and a room to match. And then, when the family gathers for a photo, no one notices that Mirabel is hanging back and doesn't join them, and we get the best I want song Disney has ever made, from the visuals, to the music, to the vocal talents of Stephanie Beatrice. The whole thing is just so good, honestly. <laughs> This is when shit really hits the fan. A roof tile falls, and the house begins to crack, doors flicker, and the candle falters, and conveniently, Mirabel is the only one who sees this. So, of course, as these things go, when she goes to fetch Abuela to show her, the cracks are gone, and everything looks fine. And now everyone thinks Mirabel is either crazy or making things up to get attention on her because she's jealous of Antonio. But Mirabel knows what she saw, so she sneaks up to the candle that night and overhears Abuela talking to Pedro. Turns out the miracle might be dying. So Mirabel decides she's going to save it. Except... <laughs> Wait, how do I save a miracle? Next morning, she asks Dolores, her cousin with the gift of super hearing, if she's heard anything. Well, actually, she asks her shape-shifting cousin Camilo, disguised as Dolores, but Dolores hears her anyway, because, you know, she's Dolores. Mirabel finds out Luisa was freaking out last night. Dolores drops some, in hindsight, very unsubtle hints about Tio Bruno. And the rats talking in the walls. And breakfast is on. This is where we begin to find out that while Mirabel might feel discarded or frozen out because she has no gift, having one doesn't necessarily make life all peaches and roses either. 
everyone in this family has some shit they're trying to quietly deal with in order to not rock the boat. Luisa, after having a bit of a breakdown in song form, tells Mirabel to check Bruno's tower, see if she can find the last vision he had before he disappeared. Mirabel does this and finds a shattered vision depicting herself in front of Casita with cracks absolutely everywhere. Which naturally freaks her the fuck out. Meanwhile, Luisa seems to be losing her gift and is having a crisis about it in the background. But because it is never just one thing at once, it is time for Isabella's engagement dinner. Isabella being Mirabel and Luisa's older sister. She is supposed to marry Mariano Guzman, but the dinner goes absolutely to hell in a handbasket. The family finds out about Bruno's vision, and Mirabel follows some rats to a portrait that has a secret entrance into Casita's walls behind it. Turns out, Bruno never left. He's been living in the walls for a decade. It's incredibly fucking sad, and I want to roll him up in a blanket burrito right now immediately. He explains that his best interpretation of the vision is that the fate of the magic hinges on Mirabel, but he doesn't know for sure because none of his other visions have ever had an uncertain outcome like this one does. So Mirabel asks him to have another vision. <laughs> And Antonio, who is here because rats like to gossip, apparently, offers up his room for it. Because Mirabel wrecked Bruno's vision cave in her little quest to find his last vision. The vision is had, Bruno sends Mirabel off to hug Isabella, much to her displeasure. Oh, your sister! That's great! <gasps> Every time. And it turns out that Isabella does not want to marry Mariano at all. I never wanted to marry him! I was doing it for the family! Sisterly bonding and reconciliation is had in song form, but Abuela still hasn't gotten with the program, so she has a literally earth-shaking argument with Mirabel, and Casita crumbles. In the wake of this, the family's powers no longer work, and Mirabel runs off coincidentally to the river where her abuelo Pedro was killed. Abuela finds her there, and tells her the story of their miracle, but this time one more true to life, not so soft as the one we were presented with in the beginning of the movie, and she apologizes and owns up to her own mistakes. There's a marvelously touching scene where she and Mirabel hug, made only more touching by Bruno riding in, fully prepared to take the blame for Mirabel, only to be immediately embraced by his mother. They return to the ruins of Casita, and the family rebuild their home and their relationship in tandem. It's very sweet, even before you factor in the family giving Mirabel the final piece of their new house, a doorknob, to place in a symbolic gesture to make up for her failed gift ceremony. And when she places that doorknob, she brings the magic back. Because I subscribe to the theory that Mirabel is supposed to be Abuela's successor, I believe this is because she is the next candle of the house that she was able to do this. Anyway, the first and most obvious thing to love here is the music. My gods, the music! I mean, it's Lin-Manuel Miranda. What else was I expecting, really? <laughs> it is phenomenal. Every song has a very distinct story purpose and gives us deeper insight into the characters, which is exactly what really fantastic musicals are supposed to do. And they're just all really good songs. <laughs> all of them went directly onto the playlist as soon as I'd finished watching the movie. <laughs> the first time. I've seen it like four times now. And the sound design when you watch the movie with headphones or really good speakers is also something else. If you pay close attention, you'll hear characters panning from left to right depending on where they are on screen, pulling you just that little bit further into the immersion. It's a really neat touch that they really didn't have to include but did anyway because they could. Then there is the animation. It's gorgeous. <laughs> 
I mean, it's Disney. Of course, it's gorgeous. They have the kind of budget that smaller studios can only dream of, and technology, too. I am fully in awe of Mirabel's skirt. But paradoxically, the best thing this movie has going for it is that it doesn't look like a Disney movie. <laughs> Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Disney's infamous case of same-face syndrome. <laughs> you know, how Elsa, Anna, Rapunzel, Iduna, and Rapunzel's mother all basically have the exact same face. And do not come at me with how it's because they're all related, partially because Frozen 2 made that actually impossible, <laughs> because here we have seven women who all belong to the same family, two of which are triplets, their third sibling being a brother, and the only two who look so similar that you could overlay their faces and not come up with too many differences are Isabella and Abuela when she was young. A fact that actually has relevance in the plot and on the character dynamics. Like, dear gods, the team behind this movie put a lot of heart into it and went up to bat for the designs they felt were right for these characters, and I am so fucking thankful for it. And then there's the subtle storytelling going on in every single layer of this movie. It is utterly phenomenal. Even characters like Camilo, who barely has any screen time, show us enough of who they are for us to have at least a bit of an idea of who he is as a character. Mischievous. Worth the shot. Caring. Deep breath in. Deep breath in. Dramatic. Yeah, he sees your dreams. He sounds A theater kid. <laughs> if you pay attention to Isabella throughout the beginning of the movie, the fact that she doesn't want to marry Mariano will not be a complete surprise to you. Also, you can easily notice how similar Isabella looks to Abuela, as well as the resemblance Mariano holds to Pedro. Based on that, it's not a stretch to imagine that Abuela was probably so eager for their marriage to happen because she wanted Isabella to have the life she never did, and probably to live vicariously through her a bit. If you look in the background during Dolores' verse in We Don't Talk About Bruno, you can literally see him in the background jamming to his own diss track. God, I love this man. Then there's Mirabel, who as the other family weirdo, is the only one of the grandkids to wear Bruno's color anywhere on her person before at the very end of the movie where Isabella adds some green to her dress. Even the fact that Bruno's new vision can be interpreted to contain both Mirabel's hug with Isabella and Abuela, and how the shifting cracks in his original vision could be taken to mean that the house had to crumble but would be rebuilt. There are about a million little details like this that you can go in and pick apart and it makes the entire movie so rich and vibrant, because while we're undoubtedly following Mirabel's story, the world around her is so incredibly rich and alive, it feels very real, and that's not easy to do. <laughs> and then there is the mirrored storytelling, good lord. <laughs> Mirabel leading Antonio to his door, and then Antonio returning the favor at the end of the movie. The differences in how the story of the miracle is presented to us in the beginning, versus during Dos Oruguitas. Abre los ojos! There's just so much here, I could go on about it for hours. <laughs> but in the interest of sparing us all a lot of time, I will not. Instead, I will simply say this. Encanto is a beautifully written, beautifully animated, amazingly composed story about healing generational trauma. It is truly amazing, and if you have not watched it yet, please do yourself a favor and go watch it. Now as to why this movie meant so much to me in particular, I already mentioned how this movie is about generational trauma, because, you know, it is. No debate to be had there, that's just text. It also goes into how that trauma will break families if gone unaddressed, and how especially hard it can be on the most vulnerable members of a family. 
those being the youngest and those who are struggling with other things on top of family conflicts. Hanging on to that, of course, come the metaphors about disability and mental illness that can be taken from Mirabel and Bruno, respectively. It's a uh, pretty popular headcanon that Bruno has OCD, but I don't actually know if I'm really on board with that one. Do I think he is neurotypical and perfectly mentally healthy? Fuck no. His best idea when faced with a crisis he didn't know how to deal with was to hide in the walls indefinitely. I think it's more likely he has severe anxiety or something similar, and his bad luck warding behaviors are a form of self-soothing rather than compulsions. And with these two characters, with Bruno being a member of the family who wasn't able to pretend to be normal to Abuela's satisfaction, and Mirabel's lack of gift essentially being a disability in a family where everyone else has one? I mean, if we're gonna be honest here, Abuela definitely has PTSD, Luisa probably has anxiety, Dolores is autistic and I will fight you on that. I know, her gift is what makes her so sensitive to sound, but me, as an autistic person with a sensitivity to sound... Listen, if you give me a character who has the exact same problem I have, but cranked up so far the handle broke, I'm going to relate to her. There's just no helping that. Peppa is... <laughs> well, this family ain't neurotypical. But Bruno, with his chronic nervousness and his misunderstood gift, stood out about it. So we don't talk about him. And if we do, it's almost never good. And Mirabel is, comparatively to the rest of her family, disabled. So she's pushed aside and minimized, shoved behind the scenes and underestimated. It's a feeling I know very well. My father wanted a perfect, normal family, white picket fence and all. He did not want a disabled child. So he pushed as hard as he could against anything that would make me visibly so. And both of my parents, for a long time, had this habit of only ever asking my sister for help. Even with tasks I had already promised to help with and could easily have done. Even though I know at least my mother did it from a place of love and concern, it fucking hurts. I also come from a family of engineers. My father works in nuclear security. My mother studied to be a nurse left that field and now works within digital security. My stepfather does too. My sister is studying at a higher level than I ever reached right now. My entire family, at least the part I've been close to, have always been highly educated. I have cousins working actively in scientific research. One of my uncles was a professor before he retired. <laughs> The only people in my family who loudly and proudly pursued careers in creative fields are people who married into it. And then there's me. Me, who dropped out of gymnasiet. I, who always consistently got good grades in everything except finish, until I hit a wall and math stopped making sense. And even before then, honestly, for as long as I can remember, even though no one ever outright said so, at least not to my face, I felt like the dumb one. The failure. The black sheep. I'm also trans, and I don't even know if my cousin on my mother's side knows, because the first and only time I met her in person, I was actively forbidden from discussing that part of my identity when she was around. Because she was newly adopted, and my aunt decided my identity would be too distressing for her to learn about in this already tumultuous time in her life. Which, okay, that's my aunt's prerogative. I can't tell her how to raise her own kid. It's technically none of my business. But I would be lying through my teeth if I said it didn't sting. So, safe to say, I relate heavily to Mirabel. And through this story, I can get something I will never have in real life. I can witness a grandparent owning up for their mistakes, and a family taking steps to repair and rebuild together. This will never be a reality for me. 
the only truly good grandparent I ever had is dead, and my relationship with her was, intentionally or not, sabotaged by the fact that my father has never, to my knowledge, put any effort into affirming my gender behind my back. Actually, he still had me under my dead name in his work phone four years after I'd come out. The only grandparent I have who's still alive doesn't care enough to do something even close to what Abuela does at the end of this movie. Never mind that it would take a level of humility she simply is not capable of. But it means so fucking much to me to see Mirabel get her happy ending. It means so much to me to see this family come together with the community they have helped for so long to rebuild their home and their relationships side by side. I will never get over seeing Bruno welcomed back into the fold with no hesitation, or Mirabel being accepted wholeheartedly by her family. Literally never. I will never get over this fucking movie. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye.